Welcome back, everyone, for our uh, discussion session following uh, Professor um, Alex Pazot's talk yesterday. And I am delighted to introduce our conversant for um, this afternoon, Professor Gila Sher of the University of California at San Diego. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. And Alex, we are delighted to have you back. Um, and uh, as a philosophy professor, her research interests um, have focused on the foundational issues in epistemology, the philosophy of logic, and the theory of truth. Her books include The Bounds of Logic, A Generalized Viewpoint from MIT Press, Epistemic Friction, an essay on knowledge, truth, and logic from Oxford University Press, and Logical Consequence from the Cambridge University Press. She's currently working on a book uh, provisionally titled Truth as a Human Value, which sounds fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, which offers a reconception of the philosophy of truth in light of the post-truth crisis. So without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Gila Sher to take the floor. Thank you. Okay, I would like first to thank Priya for inviting me to be a discussion. And I'd like to thank Alex for an extremely interesting talk uh, yesterday. I also listened to some of the other talks on your webpage and they are really fascinating. Uh, so I titled my short uh, introduction, There is much more to logic than recognized. And this is a citation from Alex. Now, I agree with most of the things that Alex said, uh, says about truth, about, about, sorry, about logic. There is much more to logic than commonly recognized. One of the things is that logic is not finite in ways it is commonly thought to be. In addition to a bottom-up way of understanding logic based on the way we commonly use it in everyday discourse, there is also a top-down theoretical understanding of logic that shows that logic is stronger than commonly thought. A very important theoretical consideration of this kind is the strong degree of invariance of logic that Alex talked about. This has to do with the topic neutrality and other special features of logic, such as formality, necessity, and generality. But there are also a significant relations between purely logical or deductive inferences and non-logical, non-deductive inferences. Not all good inferences, I agree with uh, Alex, are logical. Since I agree with Alex, I won't criticize him, uh, but I approach logic from a somewhat different perspective than him. So I will try to broaden the perspective, hence the significance of what Alex said about logic. And I will ask him if he agrees with this broadening. Among other things, I will address the question of truth in logic. And I will try to give a tentative answer to two of the questions that Priya asked Alice yesterday. What is special to the structure of mathematics compared to physics? And uh, why, and I would add whether, mathematics can't be affected by experimentation. Let's start with truth. Alex gave a simple example of a logical inference or implication. I will use them interchangeably here. Uh, the inference is if A then B, if B then C, Therefore, if A, then C. And here it is in symbols too. Now, is it true that this is a logically valid inference? Or take this inference. For some X, PX or QX. For all X, not PX. Therefore, for some X, QX. Is, this, is it true that this inference is logically valid? Now, the above inferences seem to be logically valid, but is it true that they are logically valid? And if it is, why? And does this answer extend to infinitary inferences like the ones that Alex talked about? Some people say that there is no truth and falsehood in logic. 
logic is just a game. And like all games, the logical game has its rules, which tell us when we win and when we lose. But this has nothing to do with truth. For example, the later Wittgenstein said that logic is a language game. Carnap said that logic is merely conventional. There is no right and wrong in logic. There is only what we like or what is convenient. This leads to a practiced, relativist, and pluralist views of logic. Alex, I should note, is, not, is an anti-pluralist. He is a monist about logic. His book is titled The One True Logic. Now, even if you believe that there is truth and falsehood in logic, and that it's true that the above inferences are logically valid, the question arises, why? Or in virtue of what is it true that they are logically valid? Some philosophers, perhaps most philosophers, say that this is a matter of language. Logical inferences are analytic. English users treat them as logically valid. When we put these two approaches together, we arrive at the view that logical inferences are just winning moves in a, in a language game. And this was Wittgenstein's view. What I want to show is that logic is, never, is neither a game nor grounded merely in language. I will do this first in a bottom top way by an example. Claim, logic is not just a language game. Logic must be constrained by the world Truth in the world can be a matter of life and death in logic, not just winning or losing a game. And being constrained by the world makes logic similar to physics and other sciences. Here is a short story that demonstrates this. Abe is a young, naive student at University X. He takes seriously everything his professors especially his more extravagant professors that teach him. One day, a new logic professor joins Abe's university, and he is eccentric, extravagant, and exciting as Abe likes. The new professor tells students that logic is nothing more than a game. He shares with them one of his favorite rules which belongs to a new non-traditional logic game he invented. He calls this rule modus davka. Now, davka is a Hebrew word which means willfully, spitefully, deliberately doing the opposite of what you are expected to do. And the rule modus davka is the following. First, we have a premise, if A, then not B. Then we have the premise A, and we conclude B. Abe is excited about modus davka. He decides to follow it in his everyday life. Modus davka is not a traditional rule of inference. It's superficially similar to an instance of a traditional logical rule, modus ponens, which would say, the instance would say, if A, then not B, a, therefore, not B, but it's different. Standing on the side of a busy road in town one day, Abe is getting ready to cross it. His parents told him, if a car is coming, don't cross the road. Abe takes one to be true. It is the conditional command analog of a true sentence, hence essentially true. Abe checks whether a car is coming and sees that one is coming. Indeed, many are. Remembering his new exciting teacher's favorite logical rule, MD, if A, then not B, A, therefore B, Abe crosses the road. Abe dies. MD may be an exciting rule, but it does not work in the world. In contrast, rules that are grounded in the world, like modus ponens, do. 
Modus ponens is grounded in the world. It says, if A, then not B, A, therefore not B. Had A followed MP instead of MD, he would not have crossed the road and would not have been killed by a car, at least at that time. Now, this was a bottom-up argument for the claim that logic is constrained by the world. But can we establish it also using a top-down theoretical argument? Can we establish this by an argument about the nature of logic, of the kind used by Alex to establish the infinitary character of logic? I think we can. But first, I would like to address the methodological issue of providing a top-down theoretical foundation for logic. Is it possible to provide a foundation for logic? Many philosophers believe that it's impossible. To provide a foundation for X, they say, you have to go outside X. But we cannot go outside logic. We cannot make any step in thought without using logic. A foundation for logic will be circular. This was the view of the young Wittgenstein, and many past and present philosophers share it. I don't. Why? The um, methodology used in foundational studies in philosophy, the traditional one, is foundationalism. It says that in order to provide a foundation for knowledge, all units of knowledge have to be grounded in something which is lower than them in the foundational hierarchy. Until in the end, they are all grounded in the base. The problem is that there's nothing lower than the base. So it is in principle impossible to ground the base. Since everything depends on the base, nothing can be grounded. In the case of logic, it's more direct because everyone puts logic in the base. What I believe is that there is more than one foundational methodology and a more fruitful methodology is what I call foundational holism. Here we have our system of knowledge. Different branches and different parts are connected to the world in different ways, in many places. And they are all connected also among themselves. In order to uh, uh, arrive at knowledge or to give a foundation for knowledge, we have to ground it on the one hand in the world through these all connections. And we can also help ourselves by utilizing the connections, the internal connections between fields of knowledge. The process is dynamic and it goes in a back and forth manner. Once we have a tentative foundation for something, uh, we move to another part of our system of knowledge, use new resources that we got uh, in the meantime, and we examine our found our original foundation. Whenever there is circularity, it is usually temporary and partial. It is partial because we always use many sources in order to found something. For example, in the case of logic, we use philosophy, mathematics, general knowledge, common sense, besides using logic. And it's all also temporary because we always come back and re-examine our foundation and assume different things and put aside things we assumed in the past. So using the foundation and holistic methodology, one way to go about providing a foundation for logic is this. We start with two observations about knowledge. One. For one reason or another, human beings are interested in knowing the world as it is. But two, such knowledge does not come to them automatically. And in many cases, it is quite difficult to arrive at. This is largely due to the limitations of our cognitive resources. One result of these limitations is that we are prone to error. This is where truth enters into the picture. We need truth. We need a norm or a standard of truth to avoid error. 
Another result is that we need shortcuts. We cannot discover each facet of the world individually. This is where methods of inference come into play. We would especially benefit from having a genuine method for arriving from truths that we already know to truths that we don't yet know. The function of logic is to provide such a method. Now, because our goal is true theories of the world, it's very important that logical inference transmits truth, truth in the world from premises to conclusion. And it's also very de desirable that logic provide a strong method of transmitting truth, one that works in all or most fields of knowledge, and even for cases we have not encountered yet, but might encounter in the future, that is counterfactual cases. So the task of logic is to provide a method of inference that transmits truth from premises to conclusion with a considerable modal force and generality. A logically implies B, if and only if A transmits truth to B necessarily and in all fields. But is this possible? I think it is, and I reason as follows. If one in the world, if one, the world has certain features that occur everywhere, including all parts of the world that the different fields of knowledge study and including counterfactual situations. And if two, these features are governed by laws which are both highly general and highly necessary. Then we could use our knowledge of these laws to create a general and necessary method of inference, a method for transmitting truth from sentences that are true in the world to other sentences that are true in the world, expanding our knowledge to the letter in one fell swoop. This is what we are looking for. Features or properties F1, F2 in the world, such that looking from the bottom up, it is a law that F1 necessitates F2. So in the world, a situation C1 that has F1 necessitates situation C2 that has F2. And if S1 is true, just in case C1 is the case and S2 is true, just in case C2 is the case, then the necessitation and the level of the world ensures that the truth of S1 strongly guarantees the truth of S2. And this is the basis for the inference S1 logically in, uh, implies S2. Now, are there such properties like F1 and F2? Yes, formal properties are of this kind. Properties like identity, complementation, union, intersection, cardinality properties, such as at least one, having finite cardinality n, etc. Note that at least one is the same property as non-emptiness, which is the Exist existential quantifier property. To say that there is at least one P is the same as saying P is not empty, which is the same as saying there is an X such that P X. Now, all the standard logical constants and the properties they denote are intuitively formal. And this explains how and why standard logical can't implications work? For example, take the implication for some x, ax, or bx, for all x, not bx, therefore for some x, ax. For the, prem the premises transmit truth necessarily to the conclusion because in the world there is a formal law which says that the non-emptiness of any union of any properties P1 and P2 plus the emptiness of P2, here B is empty, necessitates the non-emptiness of P1. 
This explains why the above inference transmits truth from premises to conclusion and does so in all fields and with strong necessity. All fields, for example, in the case of the natural numbers, A and B can be positive and negative, uh, properties of being positive and negative. Uh, there is at least one number which is positive or negative. No number, natural number is negative, therefore at least one is positive. And in the field of, say, American presidents, uh, this could be the properties of being a man and a woman. So there is at least one American president, which is a man or a woman. Uh, so far, there are no American presidents which are women. Therefore, there is at least one which is a man. Now, it is important to recognize that there are more formal properties than formal laws and formal laws and more formal laws than those underlying the inferences of standard logic. Okay, this correlates with the point Alex made yesterday. For example, the property is, is infinite as incountable, the second level properties are formal. And <clears throat> uncountable P necessitates infinite P is a formal law. So the inference, uncountably many x, px, therefore infinitely many x, px, also transmits truth from premise to conclusion with a strong modal force, hence it is logically then. We have done two things. One, we have provided a foundation for standard logical inferences, and two, we expanded standard logic based on the same foundation. But we also did a third thing. We expanded logical inferences to inferences that deal with infinities. Such inferences are not recognized by standard logic. This is another aspect of the infinitary character of logic. And as we shall shortly see, it is equivalent to the infinitary character of Alex's infinitary logic, which has to do with infinitely long conjunctions, disjunctions, and quantifications. But in order to reach this result, and in order to further systematize our foundation of logic, we need to systematically characterize formality, formal properties. And this leads us to the fascinating topic of invariance that Alex talk, talked about. Invariance is a central topic of interest in both science and mathematics. But the invariance used in the foundation of logic is a bit different. It is property invariance. Let me explain. Every property whatsoever has some degree of invariance. What does this mean? It means that every property remains the same under some one-to-one -one and onto replacements of individuals. Example, the property is a human. If we replace individuals which are men by individuals which are women in a one-to-one -one manner, the property is a human will not notice. It is invariant under such replacement. Most properties, however, are not invariant under all one-to-one -one and onto replacements of individuals. For example, is a human is invariant under replacements of men by women, but not under replacements of men by numbers. When we replace Biden by the number one and Trump by the number two and Obama by the number three and so on, we replace the property is a human by the property is a number. But some properties are invariant under all one-to-one -one and onto replacements of individuals. For example, self-identity. Biden is self-identical and so is one. Trump is self-identical and so is two and similarly Obama and three. Indeed, maximal 
maximally invariant properties are invariant not just under one-to-one -one replacements of actual individuals, but also under one-to-one -one replacements of counterfactual individuals. For example, identity is invariant under all one-to-one -one and all onto replacements of actual counterfactual individuals. If we replace Biden by Hamlet, for example, we also replace an individual which is identical to itself and only to itself by an individual which is identical to itself and only to itself. Identity is not affected by such a replacement. In fact, all the formal properties in our examples above are of this kind. Consider is non-empty, the existential quantifier property. Take any domains with the same number of individuals. For example, D1 is Biden, Trump, Obama, and D2, one, two, three. Now replace the members of D1 by members of D2 in a one-to-one -one manner, for example, as above. Next, take any property of objects in D1, say, is a democratic pre president. This property satisfies non-emptiness in D1, but also its image under the one-to-one -one replacement is non-empty. Its image is the property uh, being an odd numbers. Biden is correlated with one and Obama with three. And this property also is non-empty. So non-emptiness does not notice is invariant under this replacement. And this holds generally. Let us call properties that are invariant under all one-to-one -one and onto replacements of actual counterfactual individuals, maximally invariant properties. We seem to have two very interesting results. One, all the standard logical properties, the properties denoted by the logical constants are maximally invariant. Two, other properties, including infinitistic properties, such as infinitely many and uncountably many are also maximally invariant. We also have results that enable us to give a precise definition of formality. A property P is maximally invariant if and only if it is invariant under all isomorphism. What does this mean? For example, identity is invariant under, does not distinguish between any isomorphic structures of the form D domain and a pair of individuals AB. A is identical to B, and the structure D A B is isomorphic to the structure D prime A prime B prime, if and only if A prime is identical to B prime. Now, intuitively, a property is isomorphic, uh, isomorphism invariant, if and only if it is highly structural. It follows from one and two that a property is maximally invariant if and only if it is highly structural. And since to be formal is intuitively to be highly structural, we now have a precise definition of formality. Property P is formal, is by definition P is maximally invariant. Another interesting result is if a property is formal, the laws governing it are highly necessary. Reason, if a property does not distinguish between any actual counterfactual individuals, its laws cannot distinguish between them either. If they hold in any domain of actual counterfactual individuals, they hold in all domains of actual counterfactual individuals, hence, they are necessary. It follows all implications based on formal laws are necessary. This explains why all the standard logical implications, as well as infinitistic implications, like uncountably many x p x, therefore infinitely many x p x, are necessary. 
they transmit truth from premises to conclusion with a very strong modal force. Hence, they satisfy the requirements and logical implications, i.e. they are logically valid. Next, we arrive at McGee's result that Alex relied on yesterday. A property is formal if and only if it is definable in the logic L infinity infinity. This means that all infinitary implications in Alex's sense are logical. Finally, there is an interesting result concerning mathematics. All higher level mathematical properties are formal. Now, since all mathematical individuals and their lower level mathematical properties are correlated with higher level mathematical properties, all of mathematics is essentially formal. What do I mean by this correlation? For example, the number one, which is a mathematical individual, is correlated with the second level mathematical property exactly one, as in there is exactly one moon of Earth. And this is how it's usually used in science. Let me conclude with a few results concerning the difference and similarities between mathematics and science. Differences between mathematics and science, and this addresses the points that Priya uh, raised yesterday. The fact that mathematic, mathematics is formal, maximally invariant, explains what is special about mathematics. Mathematics has maximal invariance, hence its laws are highly necessary. Physical properties are not maximally invariant. Therefore, their laws have a weaker necessity than the logical and mathematical laws. For example, physical laws distinguish between numbers and physical objects they hold of the former, of the latter, but not of the former. Because physical experiments concern physical properties, which are not maximally invariant, they are generally not relevant to mathematics. They don't make a difference to mathematics. Mathematics does not notice them. It is blind to them. On the other hand, there are also similarities between mathematics and science, as Alex pointed out, or in the spirit of what he pointed out. A, although mathematical properties, I'm sorry, physical properties are not maximally invariant, some physical properties, like being subject to gravity, have a fairly strong degree of invariance. They are invariant under all one-to-one -one and onto replacements of physically possible individuals. Any replacement of physical individuals will get you from an individual which is subject to gravity to an individual which is subject to gravity. And even in the counterfactual case, say a second moon of Earth, that will be the case, a second moon of Earth will be subject to gravity. Therefore, their laws also have a fairly strong degree of necessity. B, because physical objects and properties have formal properties, for example, the property of being a moon of Earth, the physical property has the formal property of having cardinality one, mathematics and logic, which are formal theories, are widely applicable to physics. They deal with formal properties, which uh, are properties of physical objects and physical properties. This gives a new answer to Wigner's famous question about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and I would add logic in the natural sciences. The fact that physical objects have formal properties and are governed by formal laws explains also how sometimes physical results are relevant to mathematics. Whenever we get a new refutation of a scientific conjecture, there is a possibility 
that the mistake concerns formal assumptions we made concerning the physical situation. This gives us a motivation to re-examine our formal assumptions and our background mathematical theories more generally. I will end with a question to Alex. My philosophical understanding of logic and mathematics supports and expands many of your results. But people can agree on some things, yet uh, give them different philosophical explanations. Are these philosophical explanations of your result in agreement with your own general philosophical conception of logic? And if not, what is your take on the philosophical foundation of logic, logical inference, which underlies from your point of view, your results? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gila, for engaging both with Alex and many of the questions, mine and others, that came up yesterday. So, um, Alex, the floor is first yours to, um, to bring up any points of uh, agreement or disagreement or nuance that you would like us to learn from uh, a conversation with uh, Gila. Thank you very much, Gila, for this uh, very careful and insightful discussion. As, as Priya said, both of my talk, of her questions and, and the, uh, the subject matter. Um, I, sh I think I should start by saying that Gila and I are so um, overwhelmingly in agreement that, <laughs> uh, that, we can have a uh, that we can have a discussion of our differences, but that should not obscure the fact that we agree on so much of the terrain here. And in particular, we agree on this key uh, feature of logic that it's uh, infinite, more technically infinitary, um, that we both discussed uh, today. Uh, and that puts us in a, in a small minority, actually, uh, today, um, uh, in, in today's sort of intellectual climate. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, don't, we both think it for, for fairly similar reasons, although um, Gila, as she indicated today, um, adds, I, I would characterize it this way, as adds another layer uh, to it, a sort of deeper layer um, than the one that, that I um, mentioned, the reasons that I gave. She sort of gives a foundation, as, as she talked, as she said, in her foundational holist, from her foundational holist perspective. I'm happy to, to, to open the floor to other people before we start talking about those small differences, because I want to emphasize that they are uh, small. And we, we will get to Gila's question to me at the end. But I think it might be better to ask other people to intervene uh, rather than emphasize some rather small differences. Okay, great. So um, I think I'm going to uh, take the bait and ask a few, um, a few sort of clarifying questions. So, I mean, I have a couple, but let me start off with the one. So from what you've said that potentially the difference between say physics and mathematics arises, is it really the existence of laws? But then laws are not really quite reliable in the same way as proofs, right? Um, so the physical laws and uh, laws are not quite the analog, but a law, because the law is, is not a permanently stable and beyond reproach, um, sort of end all like a proof is in terms of a description. So I was curious about whether, um, you know, what is the role of laws from when you concluded, I got a sense that somehow laws are very much part of what distinguishes. So you know, the law of gravitation, um, the fact that it is indisputable in a certain way is makes it very much like a proof and that that's, but, um, but am I missing something? Is there, but, you know, I'm not entirely sure if. Um... Yeah, uh, okay. So the way I think about it is like this. Um, you know, laws in all fields are associated with some properties. So you say we have the laws of gravity, the laws of motions, they are associated with properties. In, the, uh, in logic, although we talked about inferences, we also have laws, the laws of non-contradiction, the laws of identity, the laws of uh, excluded middle, of disjunction, and so on. 
So they are always associated with properties. Now, um, especially in physics today, in the philosophy of physics, I, not in physics, I don't know how it is in physics, but in the philosophy of physics, and many people question whether there are laws at all. And uh, this is a big question. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I want to emphasize that one similarity that there is between logical and mathematical laws and, and, and physical laws is that some uh, uh, physical principles have a very high degree of invariance. It's not as high as the degree of invariance uh, of logical or mathematical laws. But the uh, physical laws are generally associated with properties that have a high degree of invariance. For example, you don't have a law of the mountain Everest, which is, you know, being a mountain Everest has very low degree of invariance. You have laws of gravity, of mass, of motion, of things like this that have a very high degree of invariance. I can a degree. There's a degree of invariance, but there is also there is a domain of validity, right? Which you do not have in mathematical laws of mathematics, if you will, or laws of logic, if you will, right? Um, you know, so again, you know, coming back to Newton and Einstein, there's a domain of validity where a Newtonian description is not only sufficient, but it's excellent and it is enough, right? right? Sufficient, necessary, and enough to describe the world and motions and everything that we can experience. However, that is not the last word on, so it's, it's a domain of validity and there's a domain beyond which it's no longer valid, right? Yeah. So there's a conditionality to laws in physics, like domain of validity, um, that you, for properties, which you do not have, right, in mathematics, like a proof is a result that is truth, that is stable, and there are no conditionals there, right? Well, not exactly, at least in my view. Okay. I mean, proofs in mathematics, uh, as Alex mentioned yesterday, are usually uh, based on certain axioms. And so they are based on certain theory, which is its identity is determined by its axioms. And um, if you accept the axioms, the proof is a proof. Right. But there is a question of whether you accept the axioms. And in the same way that in mathematics, you know, when you look at things in a certain perspective, in a certain scope, it seems that the laws are perfect. But then when you look in a broader perspective, you see, no, they are not perfect. They work well. They agree with the narrower perspective, but not the broader perspective. The same thing can happen also in mathematics. And in fact, even in logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my colleagues, um, Penelope Madi, um, you know, brought a very interesting example. She's not the first, but she worked it out, I think, beautifully, uh, that also connects logic to physics. And that's the question of quantum mechanics, where some physicists and philosophers of logic thought that the a microscopic domain turns out to be formally different from the macroscopic domain. And that, for example, it's, it may, it's not Boolean. And that might require that we have a different logic for it. Now, for me, it's a possibility. I would not say that this is actually the case, but I think in principle, it's possible. So in the same way that you moved from Newton to Einstein, we might move from Boolean algebra to some kind, a Boolean logic to some other kind of logic. Uh, now it's less likely, there are fewer, uh, it's, there's a, a smaller likelihood of changes in logic because of the enormous invariance of its principles. Most discoveries it doesn't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But that's not uh, always the case. So if, even in this way, I think there are more similarities, but also differences. If I may yeah. pitch in at this point, 
Um, and I also want to I want to follow up on this, but I also want to pick up a question in the Q and A by Joel. Um, so. Uh, from my point of view, mathematics is a fallible enterprise um, like any other. And um, what I said yesterday about non-deductive inference in mathematics, um, in a way, is supported by that thought. Mm -hmm. If deductive inference were somehow um, infallible, it was just this infallible way of getting you from truth to truth, mm -hmm. there would be something special about it. But, um, but, but, but the, I mean, but the, the, to say, to say that, there's a sort of bias here in just the, the choice of terminology. The word proof is a success word. So of course, right. if you've got a proof, it's it's successful. But the human practice of mathematics is a highly um, fallible one. Mm -hmm. So Joel in the um, uh, Joel in the in the chat brought up the uh, Wells uh, proof, attempted proof in '93 of Fermat's last theorem, which um, was fallacious. There was there was a gap, which he then took a couple of years to fix with one of his uh, a colleague. Um, and I think that just that that is just an example on a kind of grand, grand and you know highly publicized scale of the fact that um, mathematics is a human endeavor and people get things wrong. Um, so it, th there isn't anything. Uh, I mean, mathem you know, mathematics it, it, it's easier to spot mistakes. That is true, and um, it's um, there, there is perhaps a higher degree of certainty, but it's not a uh, hundred percent, and it's. Uh, you know, it's a human fallible enterprise like like any other, just a little bit more along along the uh, the, the range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will also add, add to what Alex said that you know uh, the case of wise proof ended up being a success, but in logic, for example, we have this case in which, on the one hand, Frege revolutionized logic, or maybe with the background of other people uh, uh, around him. But Russell discovered a paradox in his logic, an error, a fatal error. And this could not be corrected. At the same time, there are still things that can be done. And so Russell himself built a logic that included many of Frege's principles, but not the principles that led to the paradox. And then there were other ways of doing it, like set theory, axiomatic set theory, and first order logic, and so on. And so in mathematics and logic, I mean, it's not that you always fix it. I mean, it can really, sometimes you can be completely wrong and have to leave something, uh, reject something as a result. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Um, let me see uh, if there are any other questions. So just to answer, Joel, mm -hmm. uh, Joel had a second part to his question. There could be a flaw in yeah. um, in the, even in the patched up proof. I mean, you know, it was a hundred pages long, highly sophisticated mm -hmm. proof, uh, and we don't think there is, but that that could that could well be well be. Um, in fact, there's a sort of interesting story of a great mathematician Vladimir Voidvosky, who um, who was a Fields Medalist, and he was so shocked by what a big a major error in a proof. Um, that he decided that it was about time that mathematics um, formalized its proofs and there were sort of much more sophisticated uh, computer theorem checkers um, in order to, to eliminate error as much as possible. Um, and that has helped, but, but, but it hasn't gone all the way because I just don't think you can go um, all the way. So that um, actually, as we wait for somebody else to, I mean, that was actually going to be my, um, my question, that is it true that, so I'm curious why you said, you know, um, find it in it, that a computer will not be able to infallibly all the time discover flaws. Well, it, okay. So the, a computer will improve um, efficiency yeah. Um, and, but you know, it is a machine like any other, and that has to be tested. There could be there could be uh, problems, and it's also there's also going to be sort of bounds on capacity, right? So maybe for short proofs, it's right. going to be able to cover them, but but very long ones, maybe we won't be able to have for physical reasons of, you know, physical for, for physical reasons, not be able to build one that that manages to 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 check very long proofs and and so on. 
sure, sure, it's many steps in the right direction. Right. Um, and you've got to, you've got to, you've got to also think about how you feed a human proof into a computer. Right. Um, okay. How do you translate it in such a way that the computer can check it? Um, it that process has not been mechanized, and I that see. is a possible source of error as well. Right. So I mean, there aren't. Um, there aren't sort of, uh, you know, AI algorithms that are, you know, so in physics, for example, um, they recently demonstrated that, um, you know, for Kepler's laws, they said that if you fed a computer just the positions of, you know, planetary positions, orbits, the information that Kepler really knew at the time, then what could the computer infer from that data? Of course, you have to, you have to request that it, recover some kind of correlation or law. And then surprise, surprise, of course, it does recover Kepler's laws. And that was very surprising to us, right, in the community. But somehow, because of you know, many reasons, right? One, of course, is like the, the sort of the, the unique creative, sort of the, you know, having, it allows us to keep intact this whole idea of human creativity and the individual and so on and so forth, right? And, um, but, I'm curious whether there have been attempts to harness uh, AI to, um, you know, to mathematize the notion of proofs and uh, are there algorithms? Um, I think there was oh, yeah. a project called the Bacon Project, wasn't there? I mean, I don't know if that, that, about that particular one, but the answer to your question is yes. And in fact, there's lots of... Um, formal proof uh, checkers and not just not just that these days there are also there's also ai that um suggests theorems so mm -hmm. i think there was an article uh, earlier this year or last year in the scientific american or, or an uh, analog um about uh proofs and topology that uh, the ai um was you know was taught some a bit of topology algebraic topology and just came up with not came up with some um conjectures that it proved itself so that's definitely um, mm -hmm. on the rise. But going back to my earlier point, the way that normal standard proofs um, are written uh, in, a, in, a, in a journal or communicated in a lecture room, um, they're very wrapped up in human language, in, in human modes of thought. And so we are not yet at the point at, at which we can mechanically translate those okay. and and, and completely be sure that we've checked for the validity. That might come, I'm not saying it will not, but we're not there yet. I actually have a question to Priya about something you mentioned just now, and that's creativity supposedly as opposed to what computers are doing. So it might be disappointing if what someone arrived at creatively could arrive at simply by a a computer a, a, a proof. Um, you know, in philosophy, uh, usually when people think about creativity, they think about it in terms of some kind of immediate intuition. Mm -hmm. And in psychology also, people talk about an aha moment or something like this. Um, but it strikes me that this is not the only form of creativity. Yeah. Okay. And that we are also creative and also use intellect, not just by this kind of intuition, but ways of figuring out right. things. And that brings us closer, the creativity closer to what a computer can be, can do. But I think that this is also related to what I talked about earlier about holism, in that one very important aspect in creativity, I think, and in figuring things out, that we can always switch perspective. We can go always go beyond the place where we are and look at it and look at other things and connect them and may try to figure out things right. this yeah. way. Yeah. So the dynamics maybe of human creativity is different from the dynamics of computers. But I think, right. but, yeah, but I think that, you know, so in physics, for example, we increasingly know that uh, scientists own narrative of their discoveries are highly incomplete and they, um, they don't quite reflect 
the the range of activities because we are so fixated on this idea of the lone male genius wow. and this aha moment right that this yeah. eureka moment right that the recounting our own personal recounting of our own discoveries is not reliable and but what appears to be a robust fact across questions uh, across individuals um, is the fact that the insight, if you really drill down into what is new, what was the leap, what... So it turns out that the, the creative leap appears to be the ability to connect different domains of knowledge, which right. appear entirely unrelated at first. So we are not just talking of tools, you're not talking of language, we are not talking of methodologies of investigation or anything, but really the formal representations of ideas and properties of objects in the case of physics across domains. And that it's a language translation exercise, if you will, that is more than just the language, it's a conceptual domain mapping and uh, that we do when new discoveries are made. And you are right, if inherently that is a key part of what we call human creativity, that is hard to replicate in a computer because what we feed in is what the computer operates out of. So you would ultimately need to have a computer that has a training set in every domain of knowledge and then see if it can do the kind of, you know, connection making and synthesis that we believe that, you know, human minds have the capacity to do. Priya, I don't know if this is a good moment to discuss one of the differences between uh, Gila yeah. and me and the, yeah. the question yeah. that she, she raised at the end. Okay, so just a very briefly um, sort of summarize it. Uh, Gila and I agree on this very important claim that logic is infinite, but uh, and we give similar sorts of arguments for it. But she she gives it she founds it with another another layer on on another layer this idea of formal laws and formal features of of the world. Um, now I don't disagree with that. Uh, it's not that I agree with it either. Um, it's just, I am undecided as to whether to say something like that. And I have three sources of, of hesitation. Mm -hmm. so I'll mention what those sources of hesitation are. The first is really more of a pragmatic one. I think for dialectical purposes, mm -hmm. um, if we want to convince people that uh, logic is infinite, then adding um, kind of a metaphysical layer, if you like, might be something might be a step too far uh, for some people. That's not a reason against it. It's just a, just a dialectical point uh, and why it doesn't feature uh, heavily in, in my book because getting them getting people today to agree that logic is infinite is already quite a big a big task. The second source of hesitation um, is that in the, on the standard conception of logic, model theoretic uh, conception, the uh, models that we quantify over, when we consider whether the premises entail the conclusion, we formalize the, the, those in, in a logic and we consider the models of the premises and see whether all those models are also models of the conclusion. Those models understand understanding do not include the whole universe, right? Because they're just, they're sets and they're not the class that is the, the, um, the whole universe. So in a way, it's a, it's a little strange to couple that, combine that standard understanding, which can be, which is a standard understanding which can be um, adopted on the on the on the infinite review of logic as well. With it's that it's strange to combine that, perhaps uneasy to combine that with the idea um, that uh, logic is about the formal features of, of 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 reality. If reality is not actually one of those models, and then the thought, third source of um, hesitation, and it's not. Um, it's not disagreement, it's just hesitation about going that far, uh, I, I wanna stress, is I'm not sure how much explanation um, you get by saying of, of the fact that logic is infinite by adding this layer of saying that the world has formal features. It seems to be redescribing um, the fact of logic's infinity in more metaphysical language, uh, laws and, and, and structures and, and, and so on. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't go further, it does seem to, um, but, but it seems quite close to what we were saying before to really be a powerful explanation of it, as opposed to a redescription. 
So those are my three sources of hesitation, Gila. I don't disagree with you. I just don't go quite as far for those for those reasons. Yeah, um, well, I, ver- I, I understand very much your first pragmatic consideration. That's yeah. uh, perfectly reasonable. Uh, but I do have something to say about the other reason. Now, uh, the other, the second reason is something that was raised, for example, by Hartree Field. And um, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with this, we didn't, neither one of us talked about models uh, very much in our uh, so far. But um, there is the, the, the standard way of understanding logical truth and logical consequence is to say that there is a totality of models. Each model represents either a way that our language could be or a way the world could have been. And uh, e- uh, but um, the non-logical properties change from model to model, but the logical properties are fixed. So disjunction is always disjunction. Identity is always identity. But a property like being a man in one model, it's that property. In another, it's the property of being a woman or being an odd number or being an even number and so on. And so what is true in all models is supposed is said to be what is logically true, what couldn't be false, what is true due to the logical structure of sentences or logical meaning of uh, uh, sentences which is fixed in all models. Now, models are usually uh, thought to be a set theoretical uh, construct. And uh, a model consists of a universe, which is a set, and then objects and subsets and relations and so on, which represent the properties that uh, we are talking about in a particular sentence. And the laws that govern models are the laws of set theory. And how many models there are, how many possibilities are represented by models is uh, the number of possibilities that can be represented by sets in set theory. Now, one distinctive aspect of set theory is that set theory can represent sets, but it cannot represent the totality of all sets. And one might say that what is really real is the totality of all sets. And that set theory cannot represent. And so models, set theoretical models, do not represent this either. So truth in all models is in some way not truth in all possibilities, maybe even not true in the real reality. Now, uh, in my view, this is not a conclusive argument. And the reason is that we need to distinguish between the general idea and its implementation or processification. There is nothing about the general idea of logic that to be true is to be true in all formally possible situations. And set theory. In principle, we could have implemented a different theory. Russell, for example, in his theory of types, didn't use axiomatic set theory and didn't have this problem. And so I see this just as a matter of implementation. I think the idea is right, but we still need to find an adequate mathematical theory that will enable us to implement it precisely. Another point which is relevant is that even if we use set theory, there is a point that was emphasized by McGee and others, that in set theory itself, there are reflection principles. And these reflection principles say that even though the totality of sets is not represented by a set, there are so many sets and so many variations between sets that it is sufficient to represent any type of structure 
including the class structure. So once again, there are questions about this point, but the first point seems to me more important that, you know, the problem is in implementation and not in principle. Uh, I wonder what do you think about this, Alex? Um, I, I think you could be right um, about that. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, but the, but as, as I say, it's not disagreement, it's hesitation because I haven't seen uh, a convincing implementation of that yet. That could be my ignorance, um, which is why I hesitate to take that step. If there were a, um, a precise uh, cogent in the imp implementation that um, undercut all those doubts, then I would be, I, I, I'd, I'd join you yeah, immediately. Um, but, and there may be one, uh, and maybe we can, you know, you can imagine one, but, but I, we, I, I haven't quite seen one yet. So that's, that's why I'm, I'm a little hesitant. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's partly a matter of how you treat, you know, philosophical results. Uh, for me, you can have a solid philosophical results even without having yet a mathematical implementation for it. And the philosophical results stands at its own, but there are many people who would not agree and would say we actually need an implementation in order to substantiate uh, the philosophical result. Yeah. So in that and, way, it might be a matter of sort of temperament almost. Right. Um, right. On the second point about reflection, I, I again, I think you're right, but again, I mean, reflection is you know, sensitive to the language of the set theory and so on. So, yeah, again, it's, it's an open question. Yeah, yeah. The issue okay. of reflection, but interesting. If I, an interesting yes, but thank you for that for that response to my, my second uh, hesitation. And, and yeah. what was your last point? I forgot. Um, my last point um, was that, that the talk of formal laws and formal structure was in a way I uh, wasn't sure how much explanation it was giving you because it seemed to be restating some of the points of the infinity of logic, um, but just putting it in metaphysic, more metaphysical language. And so I didn't, I, as I see it, it wasn't giving you very much else, uh, you know, an explanation, uh, uh, B, if B is an explanation of A, it's got to go quite a bit beyond A. And it seemed like saying A in the same the, the same sort of thing as a, but in a much more physical, much more physical language, metaphysical, excuse me, metaphysical language. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, this is partly because my perspective is a little bit more general epistemic perspective, you know, knowledge in general. We want to know how the world is. So we want to know whether there are a formal properties, things in the world have formal properties, and we want to know whether there are formal laws that govern the world. This is a question which is interesting in itself, but it's also connection to the question of truth. I mean, we were talking about consequence, about implication, but in infinitistic uh, logic of the kind you talk about, there are also logical truth. And the question is whether logical truths are really true, and if they are true in virtue of what they are true. I think that the advantage of going to the world and say that they are true due to formal laws that govern the world give you a straightforward explanation of why they are true. And if you give this up, it's not clear to me how you can establish truth. This is, I think, the main issue that bothers me. I, I see that. Thank you. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think, I have so far declined to answer that that question, and it is a question that needs an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree. I, I certainly agree with with that. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think uh, one more question has showed up in the chat from Ed Brandon, and uh, so he asks. I don't think it's an ignorant question. Uh, what is the relation between valid infinitary arguments Professor Bizeau gave and what is called mathematical induction? Okay. Um, yeah. So mathematical induction, the principle of mathematical induction is a principle about the natural numbers, uh, zero, one, two, three, and so on, or some people just start at one. And it says that if zero has a property, and secondly, 
if a number has a property, then its successor also has the property. From those two facts, you can infer that every number uh, has the property. And so uh, that's specific to the natural numbers, of course. Um, it doesn't it doesn't hold in other domains, uh, in, in lots of other domains, right? Um, so, for example, if you throw in the negative integers, um, the principle of mathematical induction isn't going to hold, right? Because you could have it starting at zero and transmitting, but but never getting to the um, negative integers. Um, valid infinitary arguments, however, are completely general and apply to any um, subject matter whatsoever. Um, so um, it can be about numbers, uh, natural numbers, real numbers, but also about physical situations, um, whatever whatever you like. Does Ed, does, if Ed, Ed, if that does not answer your question, then feel free to ask a, a follow-up. Let me see if there is a... Yeah, I don't, um, I don't see a follow-up from Ed. I mean, to put it very broadly, mathematical induction is, the principle of mathematical induction is specific to the to arithmetic, to the natural numbers. Uh, logic, infinitary or finite, Gila and I both think it's infinitary, applies to any any kind of um, yeah. domain. Much broader, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, there is a there is a potential confusion with the word um, induction, induction here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. because because induction is all is used in all sorts of ways. I mean, I mean, outside academic uses, you know, you can be inducted into the rock and roll. A hall of fame right? okay, yeah. <laughs> but but even within uh, philosophy and, and mathematics it's used in different ways uh, and so when i was talking about non-deductive knowledge um that's sometimes called inductive knowledge uh, but that can be a bit confusing so i was i was keen to just say non-deductive to not call right, it inductive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. great so if um, there are no further questions I think we can um, draw our uh, session to a close. And so let me thank both Gila and Alex for a wonderful uh, discussion, a great lecture yesterday and for a really nice uh, discussion today. A clarifying sort of points of view, points of convergence and the, and the very few points of divergence in your views. But yeah, thank you so much for enriching and teaching us all so much. Yeah. So let's uh, give a round of applause uh, to our speakers today. And yeah, we're really deeply grateful to both of you for coming. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.